Hi, I'm Jack Cush with Room Now, and we just finished Rheumatology Roundup 2018 here at ACR in Chicago. Artie Kavanaugh and I covered about 15 abstracts at the 7.30 hour here on Wednesday morning. Uh, nice session, highly attended. Uh, we had fun, we learned a lot. Um, here's a few of the highlights of things I presented. Um, first was an interesting abstract about DIP involvement in rheumatoid arthritis patients. This comes from the Ninja Rheumatoid Arthritis Registry in Japan. This includes over 12,000 patients who they looked at their joint exam and specifically looked at DIPs two through five and found that of the 12,000 patients, 2% had involvement of the DIP joints. Turns out that DIP involvement wasn't related at all to age or hack or seropositivity, but it was related to disease activity. Patients who had DIP involvement, two through five, in general, about two, those who had involvement, about 2.6 DIPs per patient were involved. DIP involvement tended to portend more hand joint involvement, DIPs, PIPs, MCPs, and wrist, and that DIP2 involvement was associated with higher measures of disease, act disease activity, the DAS-28, uh, TJC, SJC, and even pain scores much higher in those who have DIP2 involvement. So, it is part and parcel rheumatoid arthritis, you need to look for it. Another interesting abstract was uh, 2220, gout flares. This is a South Australian uh, patient uh, population-based survey where they looked at the incidence of gout and how they're treated and outcomes and whatnot. And what they found was that 6.5% of the population self-reported themselves as having gout. Most importantly of those patients, only a third were being treated with urate-lowering therapy. When they coned down and looked at those patients who had frequent gout, meaning more than two attacks in the last year, they found that 25% of the population admitted to that and that only 50% of those people were taking allopurinol, suggesting we're not doing a good job. We're not doing a good job identifying these people and treating them. Uh, and, and to that uh, end, there were two other abstracts at the meeting which focused on pharmacist-led management of gout. Very interesting and novel studies, both kind of small and regional, but they basically said the same thing as was currently being reported in Lancet by O'Darty um, looking at nurse-led management of a gout clinic. And what they basically saw there, where in your practice, you're only achieving the target of uric acid less than six in less than 40% of patients. In these clinics, it's either 70 to 95%. You have better adherence, you have less flares. We got to resurrect the gold clinic and bring back the gout clinic. And this time, being led by either pharmacists or nurses who can do the job using a protocol that you design. Turns out rheumatologists, we're just not seeing enough of them. We're too busy to do a good job that we know we can do. We should be outsourcing this really to the, to the improvement of our patients. I'm going to end with a discussion of 837, the plenary session on standard dose vaccination versus high dose vaccination in rheumatoid arthritis patients. As you know, the high dose vaccine, usually quadrivalent, is uh, indicated in elderly individuals where it's been shown to work very well. Uh, they have to usually go somewhere to get it. It's usually not in the clinic. They have to go to a, a pharmacy or where, wherever. But the question is, would this work well and should we be using it in our RA patients? RA patients have a two to three-fold increased risk of, of, of getting seasonal flu. Uh, and we know that RA patients and other patients in general are not being vaccinated as much as they should be. Uh, so the question was, how should, they, how, should we, how should we vaccinate them? And in this study done in Canada by McGill University researchers, looked at, I think, 270 patients who were randomized to receive over two different vaccine seasons, either the high-dose uh, vaccine versus the standard-dose vaccine. And in the end, looking at uh, seroprotection, seroconversion rates, there was a two- to three-fold increase uh, success with the high-dose vaccine, suggesting this is a slam dunk. You really should be doing it. Uh, and then when they looked at it according to the therapies, most patients were on DMARDs and methotrexate. Many of them were on biologics. Turns out that, that, that therapy didn't affect these results at all unless you were on rituximab uh, and maybe a few others, but really it seems like it's rituximab that would impair the response. The reason this is important, that there are two drugs that do impair um, uh, immunogenicity of the vaccine, and that would be methotrexate number one, and in this case, uh, as we just said, rituximab number two. So this data is sort of convincing and may change practice, um, and I would encourage you to look at it. That's it from ACR 2018. I'm Jack Cush. Tune into Room Now.